of our earlier stream. I apologize for our technical difficulties. But I think we've gotten everything ironed out and we're really looking forward to sharing some of what we've been up to with you today. Uh, our lectures today are really going to walk you kind of through the archaeological process in a way. We'll hear a little bit about some archaeological fieldwork that various uh, members of our team have been up to over the last 12 months or so. I will then take you into the lab to talk a little bit about collections management and conservation. And then you'll get to see kind of the, the uh, last phase of our, our work where you get to really see some of the intensive research that goes on in association with our archaeological collections and uh, the historical research that we conduct. So to start us off today, I'm going to invite uh, our manager of archaeological collections, Ruth Mitchell, to join us. Hey, Ruth. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, we're really looking forward to uh, hearing Ruth talk to us a little bit about the ongoing work on the Anne Arundel Hall and Maryland Heritage Interpretive Center project. So uh, I'm going to add your slides here, Ruth, and then I will exit the stage and turn it over to you. Great. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in for our little lunchtime talk. Um, as Travis mentioned, I'm going to be talking about a building that's actually been in the works to be constructed for a very long time. And we, we call it the Maryland Heritage Interpretive Center, MHIC for short. And that'll essentially serve as a new, a brand new visitor center for uh, historic St. Mary's City. This project actually began a number of years ago um, when the college came to us and said they had some redevelopment that they wanted to do on campus. And so um, at the heart of the project was a 1950s classroom building known as Anne Arundel that ended up being demolished. And a smaller building known as Margaret Brent Hall, they actually were able to move it across the street and it's now the Philosophy and Religious Studies building. Well, fast forward to 2016 and so three new structures were constructed in the place of the original Anne Arundel Hall complex. Um, and we've always had a fourth building planned um, for this project. And that fourth building would be the MHIC building, our new visitor center. And that's gonna be a long, narrow structure. It's ov actually over 200 feet long. And the archeology span involves not just um, clearing the footprint of the building, but all of the utilities. Uh, in this image, you see a, a blue shaded area that's for storm drainage. And, you know, we have electric lines and uh, sewage and things like that that are also part of the building. It's always kind of weird, and by, I say always, this may be the first time, to see your dig site on Google Earth. Um, so, so what was left starting in 2019 of the archaeological work that needed to be done was on the southern end of the new MHIC building. And so you can see the plastic tarps and uh, the disturbance there um, from the work that we began uh, back up again in 2019. And then we had a year hiatus because of uh, the pandemic, and we went back out last year to complete uh, the work that needed to be done. And so on a project like this, the first thing we do is determine um, what, what, what could we expect to find there? And in the case of this site, we were able to dig around 80 five by five foot test units. Uh, this is the standard size unit that we dig within the National Historic Landmark of St. Mary's City. And the purpose of that is to give us a sense of what kind of artifacts are, um, are, are concentrated in areas or not concentrated. Um, oftentimes you'll excavate a unit where, where there's no sites and you really don't find much in the way of artifacts. Uh, the image on the left side of your screen shows that we were actually digging underneath an existing parking lot where we had to remove <clears throat> the fill layer off first for the parking lot base in order to get down to the intact original plow deposit. And then the image on your right shows an area where we didn't have fill there and we were able to just take the sod off and excavate the plow zone subsequent to that. And then after we do a test of, of what survived in the plowed land, we move on and use a heavy piece of equipment to strip the soils down to an original geological layer. So we remove that plowed deposit and that's where we start seeing cultural features. Um, and so this kind of pro project we refer to as ar an archeological mitigation project where we go in and remove the cultural resources. 
And so what did we expect to find moving, going into this? Well, we knew that in the 17th century, this part of the town was known as the governor's field. And it was started to be possibly developed around 1670s. Uh, we know that several one acre lot, lots were laid out in this portion of the governor's field and some of them were developed and some of them weren't. Unfortunately, the records don't really, not many records survive from the 1680s and 1690s. So we really rely on the archeological evidence to tell us, to finish telling the story, what was here, how long might it have stood. And so if there were lots developed in this portion of the governor's field, uh, the image in the upper right would kind of give you a sense of a small wooden building um, that would have been typical of the time period. And so <clears throat> then we carefully clean the soils by hand. And you can tell in this image that there's a large area of like very darkened soil. So that's some kind of cultural feature, um, meaning an intrusion in the ground from whatever time ago. It could be recent, like a, a college water line, or it could be ancient, like a Native American um, cultural feature. And some of the features <coughs> are from the 8th, 17th, 18th, or 19th century. And so one of the jobs that we have as archaeologists is to determine, is this a natural or is it a cultural feature? And so in the case of this um, image, you can see it's a really big area, over 10 foot in circumference. But then the bottom um, uh, is very undulated. There's very, it's not very regular on the bottom of the feature. And so this one, it actually, we're still not sure on this particular feature, um, but we think it might have been an, a tree fall. So there were still artifacts that were recovered within it, but um, it occurred naturally. And another large feature, you can kind of see that dark area and where um, the two uh, team members are troweling and carefully peeling back the soil to determine what do we have here? What is its shape? Is it cultural? Is it natural? And usually we have to excavate at least a portion of it if it's natural just to determine, is this just a natural random thing or not? But not all features that we find are large like that. For example, here we have two team members breaking out the spoons and carefully excavating around a really decayed fragment of bone, animal bone. And then one of the small, very small features that we found, which was surprising that it survived at all, was the bottom of a Native American hearth. So um, this just the very bottom of it. And it was defined by these um, fire hardened, fi fire reddened uh, cobblestones. And it really only had a few pieces of oyster shell and a bit of charcoal within it. So another amorphous, irregular shaped feature um, had some, some um, oyster shell in it, a little bit of charcoal. <clears throat> but we were really excited to discover very fragile remnants of Native American ceramics. And several of them were decorated sherds. Once we get, get them cleaned up and brought into the lab, we can see, oh, how many vessels might there have been? Um, is it all part of the same pot? And what kind of pot? And what size is it? So we really get, and what does it take to? We get down to all the, the details of what the artifacts are telling us. But we also found a considerable amount of Native American um, terracotta, terracotta pipe stem fragments and this remarkably beautiful decorated um, sort of a geometric pattern decoration uh, tobacco pipe bowl that's from the Native American period. But we also found on this project colonial period features. This is uh, what, what everybody's pointing to do there is a linear ditch. And then um, the two staff members to the right are pointing out post holes. So we had segments of this feature all throughout the project where there was this ditch and then a line of post holes. And what is that telling us? Here's another example of that. Some of it, you can see from this image, part of the ditch has already been excavated. It's very shallow. And so what we uh, believe this to be is a ditch that actually might well have been part of what was the 17th century road known as Middle Street. And then that consistent fence five feet off of the ditch, um, also running north-south uh, parallel to the ditch, would have been to keep animals out of the road. And so we believe in that red re rectangle depicts uh, the project area roughly. We believe that we've actually found evidence of Middle Street. And a lot of people would come visit us when we were out on the site. What are you finding? What are you finding? 
And, you know, it's not very exciting to say, oh, a ditch. But for us, we were really excited because finding bits of a 17th century road in, from St. Mary City is really rare because those roads were just made soil. They weren't made with um, brick or any kind of pavement. It would have been nice, but um, our roads have mostly been, evidence of our roads has, have mostly been plowed up um, from over 200 years of plowing. One of the irregular shaped intrusions we um, excavated, it, we found a number of uh, colonial period ceramics. And on the very far left, believe it or not, that's part of a bottle. So that's actually glass, even though it's just in very poor shape, it's extremely corroded. Um, and so we have this another irregular shaped intrusion that has quite a bit of cultural material coming out of it. We were shocked to find this very large, unusually large um, projectile point. And we believe even though the base of that point is missing, this may well be uh, from the middle archaic period, which is extremely old and, and rare um, to find. I've shown you some of the um, Native American pipes and here's an example of a white clay um, European pipe. And what's really cool about this one is it has the maker's mark on it. And we know from a lot of research that this is a William Evans pipe. And he was a Bristol pipe maker, um, active from around 1660 to 1682. So it's really great when you get an artifact that you can really narrow down a 20, 20 to 30 year period of when it dates to. And so the process of, of the excavating, carefully removing the feature, but also we spend an enormous amount of time carefully recording what we've removed. Um, a lot of times we have to take things back to the lab and reassess and reevaluate and constantly, what, what are we finding? What does this mean? And how, how are we interpreting it? We really enjoyed uh, finding very regular shaped not, <laughs> features such as this uh, post hole. Alden is working on a post hole that was part of a fence post that um, dates to the 17th century, one of those posts alongside um, that ditch, that middle street ditch. And we excavated a number of um, smaller features, some smaller post holes um, that date from a different time period. Uh, and we may have even found a few post holes from <clears throat> the 1934 celebrations that occurred on this landscape. And so again, here's another one of those irregular shaped things. At the beginning, we thought it looked like another ditch of some kind or a fence line, but, but once we started excavating it, this particular feature got really out of control and w went in all kinds of directions. Again, this looks like maybe a type of, um, a type of tree fall that got filled in. And often on these kind of projects, at the last minute, on the last week of, you know, you're racing against the clock to finish the, the project, either budget or timeline or weather, um, which is a big factor as well, we found what we thought was kind of irregular looking. We didn't think much of it from the surface, but when we started getting into it um, and we excavated it by quarters so that we could see profiles and <clears throat> understand the feature better, and we got into it, we realized, oh my, this is something quite legit, um, more than just a tree fall. And I say that because this cross section might kind of give you an idea. In the middle there, be able to make out that there's this ash lens um, and the material that was coming out of this um, small this small feature was really rich and um, you know it was a hustle a, a lot of times on these projects we, we spend a lot of time running up to the local hardware store to, to stock up on more bins because it's a race against time whether it's weather or winter is coming or, or um, you know, we're trying to get it out, excavate features really rapidly. So we stockpile the soils. <clears throat> but some of the cool things that came out of that pit that we dug um, for the very, save the best for the last, include things like furniture tacks and this complete white clay tobacco pipe bowl. Um, there were not very many ceramics that came out of this uh, feature, but there were several fragments of this type of ceramic, which, the only one thus far that we've been able to compare it with is from a, um, a feature from another site that we've excavated known as the St. John site. And we believe this could date, we don't know, we don't have an idea on the ceramic, 
but it matches a type found in um, a 17th century feature found in the 1970s. And alongside those fragments, this another um, <clears throat> terracotta tobacco pipe intact bowl and a, se a segment of the stem still attached. Very exciting find for us. <clears throat> and so it wasn't just one bowl, then we found another bowl and, you know, interesting to see the juxtaposition of the white clay European um, material right alongside the Native, Native American um, artifacts as well. And so we wrapped up the field work in December and we've been in the lab analyzing things and carefully recording um, all of the artifacts that we're finding. And we've also spent, spent a few days when it's nice out, outside um, doing water screening. So some of those blue bins, we bag up and do a water screen sample and um, carefully pick through that uh, material to get finer pieces of like fish bones and things that don't we don't normally salvage out of our quarter inch mesh screen. And so to give people kind of a general sense, this is a view looking south of where the new building is going. And um, the team is sort of standing where, where the visitors will come in and be met by um, our visitor services staff. And there's gonna be gallery space and there's gonna be a small auditorium. We're pretty excited about um, getting that um, gallery together. And this is sort of an artistic rendition looking northward. Um, and so, sorry about the frog in my voice. And so we, we have a lot of analysis left to do on the project. And um, the construction will actually begin hopefully June or July this year. And it will take about two um, years to finish construction. So we look forward to inviting people to come see us once the new building is, is up. Thank, thank you for listening. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ruth. That was really interesting. It's always great to hear about the, the uh, ongoing work uh, prepping for the new MHIC. And it's so interesting to me when I look at that project is capturing the entire sort of length and span of human occupation in this region. You've got everything going from the middle archaic period all the way into sort of the late colonial period uh, with a 17th century emphasis. So that's historic St. Mary's City in a nutshell. So thank very you. much, Ruth. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention to those uh, watching our presentation is if you have any questions throughout this this presentation or this series of presentations, feel free to leave them in the chat. We will have a little bit of time at the end for some Q&A. And so we'll be able to pull all of our presenters together and respond uh, to any questions that you might have go along. So just go ahead and dump those right in the chat on YouTube and we'll address them in a minute. Um, so right now we're going to jump to another piece of field work. Um, right now I'm going to ask uh, our our site director, Jessica Edwards, and our crew chief, Stephanie Stevens, from the St. Mary's Fort Project to join us. I'll get myself out of the way so that we can mm -hmm. see both of them. Uh, and they're going to tell us a little bit about the ongoing excavations at St. Mary's Fort. So uh, Jess, feel free to go ahead and start that PowerPoint, and we will get it loaded up. Fantastic. All right, there we go. All right, so as Travis said, I am Jessica Edwards. I am the site director at St. Mary's Fort site. I'm Stephanie Stevens, I'm the crew chief. And we're here to give you an update on what we've been doing. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the St. Mary's Fort project, uh, back in 2018, we did a geophysical survey on a stretch of land called the Mill Field that's located east of St. Mary's College of Maryland. Um, that survey showed a large variety of anomalies, uh, including this nice rectangular um, structure here, made up of all these little tiny dots, which represent posts to a palisaded structure that we've since identified as St. Mary's Fort that was built in 1634. Um, with the identification of the fort, our next, next task was to perform excavations. Um, we've been excavating at the fort site since 2019, focusing on three key areas. The first area I'm going to talk about um, is where the survey showed a large rectangular um, feature that we believe to be a cellar to a fort period building located in the northwest quadrant of the fort. So starting excavations in this area, we came down on kind of that southern edge of the cellar um indicated by some dark um humic soils filled in with a variety of materials like oyster shell bone 
ceramics, wrought nails, um, a variety of materials. Um, and this is because um, the cellar over time would have been filled in um, either by natural causes and also just from people using it as a trash pit, which is why there tends to be a lot of artifacts inside of cellars. Um, we also came down on some structural post features south of that cellar feature um, that's indicated by these uh, small and large blobs you'll see on the screen here. Um, the larger blobs, uh, our technical term, are um, large structural posts and the smaller ones in between are studs. Uh, we initially thought this to be the southern outer wall of this building going around the cellar. Um, since we found those, uh, those posts, we decided to expand our excavations to the north and east um, of the cellar area in order to try and find um, more structural posts to show us where the other walls to this building are. Unfortunately, um, we did not find any structural posts going to the north and east. Uh, this was a little bit confusing to us because um, we would expect there to be walls around our cellar. Um, because of this, we decided to turn excavations to the south, um, which actually ended up finding a large number of posts. And you can sort of see it down here. I hope you can see my arrow circling this. Um, these little tiny dark blobs are the other structural posts. Um, and this is a better image of that, showing us um, some outer and interior walls. Um, we're still not quite sure what's going on between the relationship of our cellar and the building. Um, it's possible that the reason we did not find any posts going around the um, west, north, and east side of our cellar is because this dark cellar fill is obscuring those features. It's also possible that these posts were set into the um, cellar itself, which means that we would not actually see any um, feature indication of a post. Um, we're hoping this current season to investigate more of this um, and hopefully uncover the rest of the building. Uh, these excavations have um, given us a large variety of artifacts, uh, including this beautifully intact uh, copper alloy chain. We found a large number of lead shot of various sizes. Um, we had a nice uh, bone or carved bone handle that actually came from the cellar fill. Of any of you who have seen the um, Washington Post article um, about the Caravaca cross, that is this uh, cross right here that we've uh, done some research on and found it to have Spanish origins. Um, this little button down here, um, we were very excited to find because it is an earlier uh, 17th century button, um, which is perfect for the fort period. And then we had part of an ointment jar um, tin glaze decorated that might have had some medicinal or cosmetic purposes. Um, we've also found a large variety of beads of um, various materials. We have a bone bead right here. Um, the blue and red beads here, the orange ones, and this nice robin's egg blue bead here are all glass. And then we have this really nice um, carved crystal bead. Um, the most interesting beads that um, we actually have are the orange ones here. These are called carnelian beads. And the reason why they're so interesting is that typically they um, are manufactured in India. We can't say for right now if that's what, where these are actually from, but it's definitely something that we plan to research in the future. Unsurprisingly, um, we get a lot of Native American materials um, out at the fort site, uh, since Native Americans have lived across the landscape far before Europeans have arrived. Um, we tend to get a lot of that. Um, most of what we've been getting has been Native American pottery and projectile points, and we've actually found, um, to some extent, a number of this material um, in all of the areas that we've excavated so far. Uh, this next area we've excavated is located on the western corner of the fort where the bastion is. So the bastion is this little bubbled out area here on the palisade where there would have been a cannon platform to protect it, the fort from anyone coming in from the river to the west. Uh, this area was first excavated in 2019 where we focused on uncovering the western curve of the bastion and excavated part of the palisade just north of the bastion 
and then uncovered the northwest section of what the geophys showed to be a large anomaly just inside the bastion that um, turned out to be a large midden or trash pit filled with a multitude of 17th century materials. And because we can date those materials to the later part of the 17th century, we know that this actually comes from a different occupation than the fort itself. The fort would have been gone and someone else would have been living on that land when those materials were um, put in the ground. We returned to this area during this past 2021 field season to continue uncovering this midden feature as well as the south side of the bastion where it curves back toward the main palisade to the east. Uh, much of that excavation was carried out with the assistance of 12 field school students during our annual 10-week field school program. Um, many of them came from different schools all across the country. They spent those 10 weeks learning excavation techniques and methodology and artifact identification, mapping, and some basic lab skills from the conservation and collection staff. Um, our excavation this past season uncovered more of the bastion and the midden, along with a small three by three and a half foot square pit feature and some small post holes um, that cut through the palisade. So we know that those come after the fort as well because they would not have been able to be constructed there while the palisade was in place. So these are more related to this later 17th century occupation, just like the midden. Um, we're hoping to explore these new features during our current season and hopefully figure out more about what they are and what they were used for. Um, because we have this large late 17th century midden there, um, not surprisingly, many of our notable artifacts from this area also post-date the fort. They come after the fort was already gone. So those objects would include this etched glass, a fragment of slipware ceramic, a copper alloy signet stamp, and a copper alloy still key. So all of these objects date to later than the fort period. So they would have come from that later occupation after the fort was gone from kind of that midden area that I was discussing earlier. So the last area that we've been investigating and we're actually have started our current field season in this zone too, is to the north of the site um, in an area of uh, where the palisade um, is found. And this is also where we should have the northwest corner to the palisade. Unfortunately, the survey doesn't show that. So one of the reasons we wanted to investigate this area was to kind of give us a starting off point to follow this palisade line in search of that corner. Um, during our excavations over here, we sort of noticed some interesting things about the palisade. For one thing, it is more narrow in this section than the palisade over by the bastion. Um, to investigate this, we decided to excavate a small section of the palisade. Um, excavations in this area were a little bit difficult. We found that the soil would alternate between being very hard, almost like concrete, concrete to being very soft with gravel and sand. Um, this is kind of the only in this area that we've had um, this problem occur. During this excavation of this section of the Northern Palisade, we also noticed that um, the Northern section is more shallow than the section over by the bastion. We aren't quite sure why this is. We do have some theories. Um, it's very possible that the section uh, the palisade by the bastion needed to be more robust in order to um, hold up the firing platform um, that the can cannons and guns would have been on. Um, it's also possible that the uh, difficult soils over in this northern area may have caused the colonists to have to change the way that they were construction constructing the palisade. Um, these are some things that we hope to investigate further this season. We plan to uh, opened up more excavation of the palisade in both this northern section and by the bastion to try and figure out more about how the palisade was constructed. So this is sort of where we're at right now. Um, and we hope, you know, to find out more information for you. If we ever do this again, we'll have some more to talk about. Um, I would like to note that um, the artifacts that we've talked about in this, I know that we didn't go into a lot of depth on it, but you'll be hearing more about them and other artifacts from um, the talk that our head of collections and collections manager will be giving. So, thank you.
All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jess and Stephanie. And I think it's worth noting uh, that full credit goes to these two, <laughs> along with the rest of our field crew, uh, for what was maybe the understatement of the year about these soils being difficult <laughs> on the Northwestern Palisade Wall, having been out there and seen them trying to hack through concrete with pickaxes and shovels. Um, yeah, you all are doing a great job and, and keep those backs safe. Okay. So thanks so much. Every day. So next up, we're going to uh, invite our uh, curator of collections, Dr. Jennifer Ogborn, and our collections manager, Aaron Crawford, to join us to talk a little bit about what's happening in the world of collections. So good afternoon to uh, Augie and Aaron. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Ogborn, the curator of collections. And oh, and I'm Aaron Crawford, <laughs> the collections manager. <laughs> Um, the main archaeology lab spaces at historic St. Mary City consist of a cleaning room with sinks and an adjoining dry brushing area and an analysis lab containing flexible temporary storage for our current projects. We also have a study collection, which is where Aaron and I are sitting right now, uh, that contains exemplary or unique artifacts from each of the major sites associated with the museum. Our storage spaces on the third floor of our building are designed to accommodate the particular dry storage needs of metals, larger artifacts or museum objects, and as well as the basic storage requirements of an archeological collection. Currently, the research and collections department houses approximately six and a half million artifacts in the collection. Over the last year, staff members have processed thousands of artifacts in these labs, carefully cleaning, cataloging, and storing them for later analysis. Depending on the material type, an artifact may require particular cleaning methods, such as dry brushing for metals, or carefully extracting dirt from the inside of a pipe stem. Artifacts that are particularly fragile or have unique cleaning requirements are given directly to HSMC's conservators for, spe for specialized cleaning. Some of the notable artifacts associated with the fort excavations that have progressed through the labs this year include these three varieties of ceramics, borderware, Iberian courseware, and reddish brown stoneware, and these are some of the wear types that we associate with the fort period and artifacts we look for to identify stratigraphic layers associated with that time. Borderware, the green glazed ceramic on the left, was an English earthenware produced from about 1500 into the early 1700s. The very small example on the right is decorated with tiny chips of flints, um, a technique called encrusted. The Rhenish brown stoneware depicted on the right was common on 17th century Chesapeake sites. This is a decorative medallion from a Rhenish stoneware bottle, often referred to as a Bartman bottle. And at the bottom are two, two sherds of an Iberian storage jar. These were used by the Spanish, French, and the English in the 17th century, and were used to transport and store food items. We've also had many objects of personal adornment in the lab. Um, and these have been, which you saw in the last presentation, have been found in the recent fort excavations, such as these beads and this round button. Round buttons such as these were used to fasten the clothing of both men and women in the early into the mid 17th century. The majority of the beads found so far at the fort are made of glass, primarily in shades of blue and red. These reddish orange beads on the right, which Jess mentioned, are made of a variety of chalcedony, uh, car called carnelian stone. And these were primarily produced in India as well as a few other places around the globe and were subsequently traded to other parts of the world. These beads were brought by the English as trade items for exchange with the indigenous people inhabiting this area. Two objects in particular speak to the Catholic faith of an individual or individuals associated with the fort. The first is a religious medal depicting the five people canonized in 1622 by Pope Gregory XV, Teresa de Avila, Ignatius Loyola, Isidore the Farmer, Francis Xavier, and Philip Neri. Not only does this object of personal devotion reflect the Catholic presence in the earliest English occupation of St. Mary City, it also depicts these founding members of the Jesuit order. Another, wait, can go back. All good. Another object that you may have seen in several newspapers is this cross of Caravaca. These distinctively shaped crosses are from the city of Caravaca in Spain, which, have, which has been the home of important Catholic relics, including fragments of the true cross since the 13th century. The cross of Caravaca is distinctive in shape with the two bars ornamentally decorated at each end. This style of cross is an important symbol for the city that continues to today, as well as to the pilgrims who visit that place. 
this type of a personal religious object could have been acquired by someone while in Spain, carried by a member of the clergy to distribute, or traded through exchange networks before ultimately arriving in England. Archaeologists would always like to find artifacts with very clear dates on them, but we know that these objects are very, very rare, especially in the 17th century. However, Stephanie Stevens, who you just heard from earlier, found the silver shilling at the fort site. This English shilling depicts the likeness of King Charles I, who reigned from 1625 to 1649, on the obverse and the royal arms on the reverse. This portcullis grate-like symbol on the edge of both sides was stamped on coins minted in 1633 and 1634, therefore providing us with one of those rare objects that is marked with a date that is particularly relevant for the current excavations. Artifacts of indigenous origin have also been found in the excavations at the fort site, representing occupations over many thousands of years. These objects include numerous projectile points of various shapes and uses, as well as ceramic shirts. In addition to the day-to-day -day lab tasks of cleaning and cataloging artifacts, we have also been revising some of our lab workflow in order to incorporate the new database the department recently adopted. This new digital tool is designed to store all types of archeological information, such as artifact catalogs, field information, conservation records, archives, loans, exhibits, and our research library. Not only does this database store vast amounts of information, it gives us the ability to create links between different types of records or groups of records to build information relationships that will help us with analysis, keep track of artifacts, our storage facilities, and environmental information. For example, we will be integrating lab processing into this data system such that each step within the cleaning and cataloging process is recorded and searchable by staff. Years from now, if we want to see when an artifact that is on exhibit came into the lab, was cleaned, and was cataloged, and by whom, we can scroll through its associated records to see its entire lab and storage-related history. We will also be able to search for groups of artifacts that meet specific characteristics, such as area of excavation, layer of excavation, type of feature, or even the color of its decoration, and use these groups for spatial and statistical analysis. This database is also mobile. We can take it with us when we are working in the collections, in the field, and in the labs. This allows us to update records quickly and efficiently. We can even quickly append photos to records. The practice of digitizing lab processes is helpful at always keeping our team on the same page and with the most up-to-date information available. Of course, it is also important to keep our community informed as well. This is why, about a year ago, we decided to revive our department's Instagram and begin regularly posting updates about current projects in the department. We love getting to share what we find really exciting and fascinating, and Instagram has been a huge help in continuing community engagement that we've been missing for so long since COVID-19. This is especially true for all the posts we share that get into lab processes that largely take place behind the scenes. Like many other labs, we had to make the tough but necessary decision to suspend lab tours until further notice due to COVID-19 concerns. As such, one of our upcoming social media projects is to create short one minute long narrated videos that offer a virtual tour for each of our labs in the research and collections building. Our hope is that viewers will feel more connected to our work and feel comfortable enough to ask questions that can then inspire future posts. An example of this engagement can be seen in these posts here. In the first photo, we have some lab sh staff showing off a storage area and a caption that invites questions to be asked in the comment section. One viewer asked, what is the oldest artifact that you have in your collection? This led to a post featuring a projectile point dating to roughly 10,000 years old. If not for this question, we might not have thought to share this, this particular artifact with our followers to enjoy. We are happy to discuss what we find exciting, but we are always open to reporting on what the community is most interested in as well. Recently, the lab team has engaged in more in-depth conversations about specific artifacts in real time as the research is being conducted, as well as providing regular artifact updates as they move through the lab processes like washing, cataloging, and conservation. You can see here that we highlighted this cannonball several times that was found during the 1984 surface collection out of the mill field, where we now know the St. Mary's Fort to be located. During field school last year, students got to work on removing the uppermost layer of corrosion by using called air abrasion, 
We showed when the air abrasion was halfway completed. And as a small teaser, there will be an update in the next week or two about showing a recent photo and about where it is now at the beginning of the current desalination process. This post from 2018 shows a ceramic piece that was not identified at the time it was posted in the field. One of our followers commented on the post offering the suggestion that it was a possible spindle whirl. Subsequent research has indicated that it isn't a spindle whirl, but that these conversations are important to keep connections between us, the public, and our professional colleagues ongoing during the pandemic. We hope you enjoyed our brief virtual tour of our lab spaces, our current major projects, and some of the objects we've recently worked on. If you would like to follow along with our current lab work, please like and follow our department's Instagram account, as well as the museum social media accounts, where you will see frequent updates and can comment and ask questions of us and about our work. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Aaron and Augie, for sharing a little bit about the world of collections with us. And so we're going to say goodbye to Aaron and Augie, but we're going to stay in our offices and laboratory spaces and invite Stephanie Whitehead, our conservator, to join us and talk a little bit about where we are in the world of maintaining objects, making sure they're safe, comfortable, happy, and healthy. So let me I'll turn you. it over to you, Stephanie. Thank you very much. Hello. Um, I am Stephanie Whitehead. I am the conservator here at Historic St. Mary's City. Um, to start us off, I just wanted to show you this lovely image of uh, a flintlock firing mechanism. Uh, you may be looking at it and thinking, how do you know that? <laughs> uh, one of the wonderful things that we have in our facility is an x-ray machine. So while I'm explaining what conservation is in a historical context, have a, a, a wonderful look at this x-ray of that flintlock. Um, so his, historical conservation is the preservation of original artifact material. Our goal is to stabilize the artifacts so that the deterioration is slowed as much as possible. You can't ever really stop corrosion, but also to ensure our treatments are as reversible as possible. Removing corrosion is obviously not reversible in itself, but we do use chemical treatments on artifacts to stabilize them, or we put coatings on our artifacts. So we try to ensure that these are not altering the actual fabric and makeup of the artifacts material culture. Um, we want everything we can to be able to be undone in the future if they find better treatments and things of that sort. Over the last year, we've had a variety of activities in the lab. Um, one you might be more familiar with, uh, and we've discussed brief, uh, quite a bit so far, is the, um, the Fort Fines. Uh, sorry, as I'm struggling to, there we go. <laughs> um, so the 1634 Fort Project has been quite exciting. Um, occasionally, we get called out to the field uh, to check on artifacts. The crew will call us and say, we're not really sure how to safely remove this from the ground. Usually, it's an artifact that's really fragile. Uh, once there was actually an outline of a spoon that was left, but the actual interior was completely corroded away. Um, but this here uh, was a, a rare day where we were called out to the field to look at a very thin chain. And you can see in the top, left picture here. It just looked like a few links. We weren't really sure what was going on. Um, Joanne, who's also a conservator here, and I were very excited to come out to the field. We actually got to spend the day, the, it was a whole morning out there, slowly excavating on site. We actually got to excavate the whole thing. And you can see that this copper alloy chain uh, went from being a few links to being a fully articulated copper alloy chain of quite a size down here. It was quite something, um, you know, <laughs> just to shout out again, the Instagram that we have uh, at DigHSMC. If you are interested in following along with things like this, or you want to see a video of us actively excavating this artifact, you can check it out on our Instagram. Um, make sure you always check the stories as well as the photos that we post, because there's always more information up there. Another familiar fort find is the Caravaca Cross. Um, it was incredible when it came in. You can, see it was very distinct shape. We were very excited about it. But as I was cleaning the artifact and removing that corrosion, it was 
just incredible to me what a beautiful patina this artifact had. And patina is a protective corrosion layer. So it's that dark green color that you see on here. Um, it, it's, it protects the, the original material. So it was beautifully intact and it had those very delicate detail lines that go around the entire border of the artifact. Another, um, another artifact from the fort is the shilling. Um, this one didn't really need a lot of work. It came in pretty clean and pretty sturdy. Uh, but I have to say, as you know, as I was working on it, it was just incredible, incredible to me the amount of details that were still intact on this coin, down to the waves in the hair and the strings on the harp. Of course, finding the maker's mark that was only used for two years was very exciting. There was much excitement in the in the office when we we cleaned that one up just and, and confirmed that as well. A more recent artifact that I've worked on and Augie briefly touched on is the what we're calling the Five Saints Medallion. We could tell even covered in dirt that there were really interesting details that were evocative of religious figures and emblems. But once I was cleaning it under the microscope, details began to really pop. You can see what each figure is holding. They each have eyes. Their wardrobes are distinctive. Um, we've actually been able to identify the saints on this medallion based on that in, in their specific order. Um, and to give you a scale for this artifact, it's a, roughly the size of a dime. So to be able to see the eyes of each individual, you can't even see them in this photo very well, the after image. Um, but under a microscope, you, you can see such incredible detail that is still beautifully intact. It was absolutely wonderful to work on. And then over the summer, we had field school in our labs. Um, this was the first time we've actually been able to offer time to students in the conservation lab as part of their experience. Each student had a full day in the lab with me and was able to receive hands-on experience with artifact conservation. They spent their mornings working with artifacts under the microscope using a variety of different tools so that they can just get that hands-on experience and see how it works. Um, and as well as using our photographic microscope, which you can see up here um, is, is showing up on the screen is that, that corrosion in, in high detail for them. I think what our students were most excited about, however, was our the afternoon where they got to work in the air abrasion machine. Uh, oh, air abrasion is essentially micro sand blasting, um, where instead of using sand, we use aluminum oxide powder to gently and carefully remove the layers of corrosion from iron artifacts. Each student started with a piece of slate to get used to the machine. Then they progressed onto a corroded piece of modern rebar to practice removing layers of dirt very carefully down to the very right level. You don't want to go too far and expose the core metal. Uh, so th they, they spent some time practicing getting it to just the right area. And once they showed that they understood that, I let them work on a cannonball. Um, this is the one that Aaron was discussing earlier. Uh, they all worked on the same cannonball over the course of the summer. And you can see from this photo to the next slide here, uh, the, the evolution of the corrosion process from nearly the beginning student to roughly the end. Um, everybody took a, a good chunk of space and slowly worked. I was really impressed with the skill level of all of our students. They did a great job. Um, so that was a lot of fun. And as Erin said, we're going to be updating further on how that cannonball is doing uh, in, in our Instagram. So the other large uh, projects that's been going on in our lab is an ongoing Institute of Museum and Library Services grant project. This project began in October of 22, or in October of 2020, and will be completed in September of 22. The goal of this project is to complete conservation of high priority artifacts from excavations that were conducted between 1988 and 2002 to give you an idea of the scope of that, that covers uh, the chapel, St. John's, um, a, a fair amount of town center, the print house. There, there are a lot of, of large excavations during that time. 
So there's a variety of artifacts and, and locations that these artifacts have come from. The grant has allowed us to hire conservator Joanne Hoppy, who has been an incredible asset to our team. Um, often people think of conservation as, you know, generally just cleaning the artifacts and putting them back together. Uh, but that is, and, and that is a good part of it. And that's definitely the fun part. Um, but before that's possible, there are many hours that are devoted to pulling those artifacts from storage, checking the housing and the packaging of those artifacts, making adjustments that's as they're needed. Joanne has worked on roughly two, has worked through roughly 250 boxes and looked at over 3,000 artifacts over the last year and a half. Um, once she has uh, the artifacts in the lab, she performs x-rays, like the one in the beginning of our slide presentation. Um, so she, she does, we have a digital x-ray on site, which allows us to x-ray all of our metal finds, which is unique to our facility. And we do this because it helps us see below the corrosion layers to the details that are hidden the brighter the white, the more dense the material is. So it also helps us as conservators know, you know how, how sturdy is the material that we're about to work with? Will it hold up to different types of treatments or will it likely completely fall apart if we try to treat it? Um, for instance, you can see this knife right here. The, the handle is really dense and beautiful, but the, the blade itself is almost completely um, shadow at this point, and it's not really very strongly there. You can also see in this uh, a padlock down here, you can see all the mechanisms and the inner workings and things like that. So there's always really wonderful things that x-ray can do for us. So we do that for all of our um, metal artifacts. So with the knowledge that she gains from that, and many years of training, Joe then goes ahead and begins to treat the artifacts. A lot of her work is at the bench and microscope using a scalpel or glass bristle brush to generally remove encrustations from copper alloys and lead artifacts. She also spends a fair number of hour hours in the air abrasion room, carefully taking down layers of iron corrosion. In fact, the cannonball that the field students worked on was one of Joe's artifacts from this project. She removed the last layers of the corrosion after the field school students were finished and they then began the desalination process, which is still currently undergoing. Uh, once artifacts have had their corrosion removed in most cases, a protective coating is applied to the exterior of the artifact as a barrier layer between any agents of deterioration, such as air, moisture, things of that sort, and the metal itself. Um, these are some of the intriguing artifacts that Joe has been working on. So you can see this is a, a buckle or, or piece of horse furniture and it's got these, this wonderful leaf design down here that was lost on, under all of that. And you can see it's a little bit shiny because of that coating. Um, another artifact that she worked on is this really neat copper alloy buckle. Um, it's it's relatively tiny buckle. Um, so again, probably has something to do with horses potentially. Um, one that I find I, I, I'm really excited about is this bone handled knife she has. She actually has a few of these, but this one is particularly interesting to me. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's a composite artifact of bone, lead, and iron. She has been doing research on the most recent methods of conserving such a composite artifact. You never really stop learning in this field. There's always new papers and articles to read up on. And this is a great example of that. And I'm excited to see where she goes with this one and how she tackles it for treatment purposes. You can see that the bone handle here is attached with these iron pins um, right there. And then there's the lead that kind of clamps on the ends. So it's, it's going to be a very intriguing project, uh, and I'm excited to see where she goes with it. For future, we continue to work on the Fort Fines, as always. Um, we're going to begin treatment of the Calvert House artifacts as well. Um, for those of you who are familiar with our site here at HSMC, there is the Calvert House in Town Center, which has used to be the field school used to be located out there for at least a decade. Um, so we have a plethora of artifacts from that area that we are looking forward to treating. 
And we are looking forward to performing a conservation assessment on artifacts that have been collected via surface collection and shovel test pits. So conservation assessment basically is just to assess and see how stable the artifacts are and, and whether or not they need that interventive treatment or not. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, thank you all for your time. And I'm glad that I am able to share this with you. And I hope you have a good day. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And thank you to you and Joe for all that you do to uh, you know really perform work that's core to HSMC's mission of stewarding the artifacts that are recovered from the National Historic Landmark. So thanks so much. All right, and last but not least, uh, today we are going to invite uh, eminent Chesapeake scholar, Dr. Henry Miller to join us today to talk about some of the research that he's been doing uh, into the, uh, the furnishings of an exhibit that actually feels like it dates to uh, a few years ago now, but we're gonna finally get this thing wrapped up, uh, the Brick Chapel exhibit. Thanks to Henry for all of his great work. So Henry, I'm gonna pull up your slides right now. Um, I can see your presentation okay. if you wanna get it started. Good, good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, appreciate your attention. Here we go. All righty. Well, we're talking about the one of the projects that the museum uh, has been conducting for many years, and it's a really significant one. Early Maryland, the design that Lord Baltimore created featured liberty of conscience and the free exercise of religion. And that was a very unusual uh, application during that troubled time period. Uh, the chapel is really a both a physical and a symbolic expression of those policies because it was built in the 1660s by the Jesuits and was a very prominent building in the colony. But in 1704, due to a revolution that had occurred, that experiment in religious freedom ended, the building was locked, and it was within a few years torn down and forgotten. We began under the direction and field supervision of Tim Reardon, we began in 1988 the excavation of that building to first find it and to unravel what it was like. A massive foundation, a brick building, many architectural clues. At the conclusion of all that archaeology and the analysis that we conducted, we began looking for uh, the concept of what the building was actually like. That involved archaeology artifacts, but also precedents. What were the Jesuits and other religious orders building around the world during the 17th century? That information was then taken, and we met with some very impressive architectural historians and other scholars to come up with a sense of what this first brick building in Maryland looked like. And in the late 1990s, we devised a, a view of that building based on all of the evidence. We also produced a conjectural image of the interior uh, way back then, over 20, uh, 25 years ago, of how it may have looked. So that was the goal. Because of the importance of this building, the museum decided to reconstruct it. We began that in the early 2000s, following the same procedures that they would have used in the 17th century, and the walls began to rise. Finally, in 2009, the structure was completed architecturally, and it was totally open to So that was a big achievement. But alas, the interior is still not. And that is the goal that we're going to be working on. But it raises the question, what was the interior like? How would it have been finished? There are no descriptions that we have So for that, we have to look at three lines of evidence. The archaeology of the clues, any surviving religious objects of the period, but also the churches that were being built by the Jesuits and others during this time period. The archaeology, uh, based primarily on the description of graves, there were about seven graves inside the building, has showed us that there was an area that was on a certain altar. Then there's also a sort of a blank space uh, 
Charles is there. Charles the Supper who worshiped in the chapel before the altar was a general. It was in his home from the second to the second. Charles Bell of Carrollton, the young Catholic society, and the Catholic society in the end of 1751 was given to the sisters of charity. And the whole family of war, as expressed by a flag on the side of it, said that this. From Maryland by another Hindu right of 1602. It also stated that it had been at the church at the city and it was presented to the sisters of the people. So there's a, a long history of association with this. Uh, it is beautifully decorated, all the children, the world, art world, all beautiful column heads. The duo significantly is a IHS with a cross. That is the CEO of the Society of Judges. So those were important things. The sisters in the early 2000s gave us permission to try to examine this object, and we brought in a Smithsonian experts in both wood analysis as well as furniture. And they took samples of it. Regrettably, the tabernacle in the probably late 1800s was painted. And then in the early 1900s, somebody decided that it didn't look like a split the surface of that for a bare view. That removed 99% of the original surface. But the furniture expert in the lower corner there took samples of all of the clothes. And what he was able to determine is that all the clothes they have been gilded, which is a very important tool of the quality. Analysis of the construction also revealed that the bottom part of the surface was rigid, but the top bone section was a later replacement. The art was carving of us quite different. So it had to replace the work at the bottom as to the original section, but the top part was linearly the tabernacles of the 17th century look at. I've looked at multiple examples in Europe, and generally speaking, there are most marble, precious stones. They're very beautifully executed in terms of a architectural format. Uh, the one on the, low, on the left is actually the first one in a Jesuit church, and it uh, from 1570. See this architectural format, the tabernacle of the world was solid. The wooden tabernacles are a much larger to rotate. The bone made have been able to track down several, particularly one in Croatia, and one on the right is was brought to Ireland and used by James II. He was in Ireland during that period after the war of his revolution. I was given permission to study it and they're doing a photograph of it. Based on this information, analysis of that it looks something like this to be on the top would be covered with a four and cross that has already been made for us. What about the altar itself? Uh, the altar format was actually set during the council of the Lewis Council of the Altar itself, St. Charles, and the other. And this is examples of those altars, uh, the elements of the altar. These are all very large churches. Uh, the chapel is much smaller. So what I've done is looked at smaller chapel settings for that. And you see the same repeated just on a smaller scale. Altar, there are still columns above it, and there's a pediment above it, and the richest part of the altar. So, so these are models that we can follow. 
Le déjeuner est en train de me dire ça, ça fait un morceau de la nourriture. Le déjeuner est en train de me dire que c'est un morceau de la nourriture. Um, one of the issues that we have is uh, what we just want to apply. You know, Jesuit scholars have suggested that this piece of art you see in the Apocalypse, which is a Salus Profili Romani, or the Salvation of the Roman people, might have been painted around 500 AD and the beginning of the main church of some religion of the world in Rome, may be the model. It was first published in 1569, and the pieces were immediately sent to 40 Jesuits led by St. Ignatius Oliveira, who was going to Brazil, and they were captured by Protestant pirates, 40 of them. 39 of the Jesuits were tossed overboard to ground, and Father Ignatius was holding the painting of the Virgin Mary and David Jesus. We know about that because the 40th Jesuit was an excellent cook, the pirates kept him along. That's why they were this became the icon that was widely introduced by the Jesuits into their missions around the world. So we believe that it is a good candidate. And the chapel wall you see here is the first time it's been presented to the You will see it. the tabernacle itself, the religious part, the overall theme based on what was being used during that time. So this will be the altar itself. The altar, though, rests within a sacred area. And that is defined by an altar layer. We see every major church has an altar layer. This is where communities with meals receive communion during the mass. That's the practice that lasted over 40 years after 1970. And looking at research, we know what these altar layers will look like. And this is the design for the altar layer that will go into. So that completes the sanctuary of the church. But there's one other element in the chapel, and this is a critical piece because where you know, so many would be given in the chapel in this book. Now we can many different purposes of the chapel. The Anglican ones are quite different, and the Catholic ones are a much more elaborate use But the basic form is very different. So this is a preliminary looking glass. This is all moving forward, and it is our hope that in the next year that the temple of Zip will finally be completed. In 35 years after the start of the Alpine College, and in doing so, it will allow us to better tell this very quick story of the world, but also this only Thank you very much, Dr. Miller. Um, that rounds out our presentations for the day. So I'm going to bring our presenters back into the fold here and we will join, uh, join everyone together. Should I just reduce it? Um, yeah, you can reduce it yeah. now. There we go, thank you. Go. All right, I've got our, our group of five presenters with us today. And so uh, if anyone who is watching who's stuck with us for our, our, uh, our presentations today has any questions, please feel free to add them into the, the chat onto our, our YouTube channel. Um, we do have a couple of questions that came through earlier. Um, so the first one I'm going to pull up here. This is from uh, Diane. And so uh, Diane asks, how do you know the date of something made from rock, like uh, some of the projectile points that we've talked about? So I'm going to ask uh, that uh, Dr. Jennifer Ogborn, our curator, handle this one about how we, can, how we can date things made out of rock. So there's a couple of different ways um, we can do that. And the first way is um, sometimes the uh, materials found around the rock can also date like um, carbon-14 dating, if there's a charcoal deposit that we know is sealed into a feature, we can use that to help date a point that it's associated with. And we 
the beneficiaries of a lot of previous research. And so we use comparative collections, we use comparative analysis of archaeologists who have uh, done previous work to help inform our identifications of these objects. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Augie, for that. Um, yeah, and it's something that we have to engage in on a such a regular basis. As you've mm -hmm. seen in the presentation today, we find evidence of, of uh, indigenous occupation at every site that we work on. So it's really important to be able to do that kind of comparative work. Um, we have another great question from uh, also from Diane uh, asking us, how do we know the uh, from the St. Mary's Ford excavations? How do we know that the, the cellar feature, it was actually a cellar and not just a, a pit full of garbage? So uh, which which it, it can be both, in fact. So uh, Jess and uh, Stephanie, if you all want to tackle this one for us. Um, one of the big clues is the, the shape that kind of came up on that geophysical survey is very rectangular. Um, you don't really find that in uh, the natural world. Um, so that's one of the clues that it's a cellar. Um, we also know because that geophysical survey also kind of gives us depth information as well that this kind of rectangular um, shape goes all the way down. Um, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head how deep it was showing. It was like three or four feet, I think about. Um, so that's kind of like our biggest clue about why we believe that to be a cellar. Um, it's also on the correct orientation. So all of the buildings and the fort palisade itself are on a particular orientation and that pit is also on the same orientation. So that tells us that it is related to the building next to it. Excellent, thank you both. Um, if there are any other questions, feel free to add them to the chat. But in the meantime, I was hoping uh, now that we've, I think we've, we've migrated Dr. Miller to hopefully a better uh, tech setup um, and our apologies again for any, any issues that we had. Um, Dr. Miller, I was hoping you might reflect a little bit now that we are uh, approaching a, a uh, perhaps an end point on this exhibit, as you said, that was about 35 years in the making. What have you found to be the most rewarding part of the chapel project going from the excavations all the way into um, moving, looking at completing the furnishings? A, a building that has been lost for three and a half centuries was the most exciting part of it. Working with the masons, working with the architects, and as anybody in archaeology knows, weighing every clue you can possibly find and precedence with other churches and stuff. It's not something that I've worked with before, but it was essential for us to move to an understanding of this very important early building. So that's it. And, uh, and it's an ongoing process, but I think when we finally pull it together, it will be a very unique exhibit in America, for sure. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, in, in the meantime, um, we did get a, a question um, from a, a familiar face. Uh, Dr. Gillette asks uh, to Dr. Miller, to what extent would the interior decoration of the chapel uh, dictated, uh, dictated by the types of natural resources available in the Chesapeake Bay? So could... Uh Absolutely. The, uh, the, there is no stone in the area, basically. So clay for making bricks would be a very important determining factor. There's also no uh, limestone source. So the lime had to come from oyster shell to create both the mortar and the plaster. So it was dictated by the limitations of the environment in which they were in, but they were also sticking to the overall architectural precedents that they were had seen in Europe. It's just in brick, not in stone, as was the most preferred building material of the time. And, and Dr. Gillette's follow-up question, um, how much could reasonably be transported from Europe? Uh, certainly the tabernacle, I believe, was made in Flanders. Uh, we don't know about the other elements of the altar because obviously they do not survive, but we do know that the brick and the roof tile the, um, and the mortar were all made locally, but approximately 14 tons of stone for the floor of the church was imported probably from continental Europe. So they, there was definitely uh, some ability to transport some of the key construction materials here. So that is, a, again, a very good question and another story about this unusual building. 
Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Augie, I was hoping I could turn back to you uh, on the question of the database. The database has been a, an exciting project for us, and, and you can tell you're an archaeology nerd when you get excited about a, a computerized relational database, perhaps. But, um, you know, we haven't shared much uh, with the public about the possible avenues, just that we've been brainstorming, nothing's in stone yet, but uh, what we've been thinking about in terms of, of a public-facing uh, aspect of that database. Could you just talk briefly about what rediscovery enables us to do and, and any sort of possibilities for the future of how that might uh, be more available to the public? Sure. Um, well, while most of rediscovery remains internal to the museum, it does have a component that allows us to essentially check a box that says, is this web ready? And so we can design certain types of records and create different types of um, places to fill out information that are designated as web ready. And at some point in the future, we would like to create um, an interface with that section of the database and a section of our museum's main website where we can easily port this information directly from the database to the forward facing website so that um, digital visitors can see glimpses into our collection and see summaries of what is significant about the objects, as well as objects that it may be related to elsewhere in the collection. And this will enable us to have certain elements of the collection searchable online for both the general public and for scholars who may be interested in doing further research here in our collections. Yes, we continue to be excited by, by the many things that the, the database is going to bring for us, both analytically, but also as part of our interpretive mission. You know, that's, that's one of the great things about a tool like this. Um, we've gotten a question from Richard asking, what is the interface of our lab with the Mac lab? And, and I'll, I'll tackle the first part of this, but then I'm going to hand off to, uh, to Stephanie to uh, finish this up for us. But um, you know, the, the Maryland Archaeological Conservation Lab and the archival storage at Jefferson Patterson Park and Museum is the primary archaeological repository for the state of Maryland. Just about every artifact that is excavated outside of the St. Mary City National Historic Landmark is archived in that space. And so they serve a, a truly critical role for the state acting as a, a primary repository. Uh, Historic St. Mary City is the exception to that, uh, that sort of rule where we house all of our artifacts recovered from uh, the landmark here on our site. Um, but as far as our interface on the conservation side goes, we have to turn it over to our conservator. <laughs> we are, uh, they are fantastic colleagues to have right down the road. Um, you know, for instance, I'm sure you noted that I had that thank you to the Mac Lab for the images. Um, technical difficulties occur no matter where you are. So they, uh, when that happens, we run down the road and they, they let us borrow equipment at times um, and vice versa. We we have a really good rapport with the conservators there. And I, I can't say enough how lucky we are to have them down the road and we change we trade ideas and literature and, um, you know, uh, uh, new new methodologies and things like that. So we're in we're in pretty pretty regular contact just as colleagues. Yes, we're very very glad to have uh, such expertise nearby that can interface with our own experts. Um, definitely definitely a wonderful resource for the state. Um, Richard also asked, uh, will there be public tours of our lab this year? Which I appreciate that question, Richard, because it allows us to shamelessly plug uh, our uh, Tidewater Archaeological Weekend program. Uh, this is a program that we run every year when we have a archaeological field school on site. Um, it typically runs in sort of the third weekend in July. This year it'll be July 23rd and 24th. That's a Saturday and Sunday. Uh, during that weekend, while the museum is open, members of the public are invited to come out to our site. Um, we'll be working at the St. Mary's Fort site and you can come get your hands dirty, screen for artifacts with our team. It's the one time really out of the year where we bring in members of the public who are just interested in archeology span and, and wanna kind of give it a whirl. Um, but during that time, we'll also be offering tours of the property. Um, we typically will offer tours of some of our major sites. Dr. Miller has offered tours of the, the chapel in the past. So if you wanna see some of the progress that's going on at that site at that time, uh, we'll be able to do that. And we've often offered uh, tours of our laboratory facilities. And so uh, keep an eye out on the, uh, the museum's website, hsmcdigshistory.org and uh, to our own Instagram page uh, for our department, which is at DIGHSMC. And we'll have more information about Tidewater Archaeology Weekend coming up 
uh, in the coming months. So that'll really be the time to come in and, and get the behind the scenes look. Well, I want to thank everyone who stopped by to uh, visit with us today. Again, apologies for the, the technical difficulties that we had throughout, but uh, I hope you got a little bit of a glimpse behind the curtain, as it were, to see what our staff has been up to. And, and in the brief time that we had today, we couldn't cover everything. So uh, we continue to stay busy. We continue to work on, on these important projects, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. So feel free to be in touch uh, via our Instagram or Facebook page and uh, let us know what you're thinking. And we look forward to doing this again with you in the future. So thank you all so much for sticking with